The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of John's Gospel. Familiar words this morning. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. John chapter 3, we'll begin there with verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O God, we pray for ears to hear. Ears to hear your words, not the words I put in the way. Eyes to see the way you have before us. Hearts open to receive what you have for us. And Lord, hands, feet, whole bodies ready and willing to respond. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I bet most of you have a morning routine, or at least a routine from the time you wake up till you go to work. A whole rhythm you go through from that time when you first open your eyes. Maybe the second or third time the alarm clock goes off. Maybe not the first one. When you wake up, you go, I I generally have mostly the same routine. I wake up, I make coffee. Carter always sees to it. He asks if I'm going to make coffee. Am I going to make him breakfast? Most of it's the same. A lot of the parts vary sometimes. What, What part, when I take a shower, that sort of thing. But lately, there's one part of my morning routine that has remained constant. Each morning after I get dressed, Carter gets dressed, I get him into the car seat, I sit in my driver's seat in the car, I push the button to start the engine, which is a phrase I never thought I would have said 15 years ago. (laughs) I push the button to start the engine, and inevitably right from behind me in the seat I hear, I want to listen to the crab from Moana. (laughs) Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, maybe. So every morning... From the time I leave our driveway to just about the time I pull into the daycare here at the church, I listen along with Carter to the song Shiny from the soundtrack to Moana, sung by a New Zealander and a guy I actually kind of like, one half of the Flight of the Concords, Jermaine Clement. Now, at first, I didn't really care that we listened to this song. After all, it beat the kids' bop version of Old Town Road for the millionth time. <laughs> Gradually, however, that song began to be a bit annoying. <laughs> So I'd ask Carter, Carter, let's listen to something else. Can we listen to something else? Uh, what, what about, I don't know, Old Town Road again? Maybe I don't know. Can we listen to something else? No, I want to listen to the crab song. I tried sneaking in Under the Sea from The Little Mermaid, 
thinking uh, I could feign ignorance as to what crab he was talking about. But after a few dozen times listening to that song, I, I found that I started maybe to like the song myself. I don't know if there's a musical equivalent to like Stockholm Syndrome. But, but these days it's almost robotic. I, I get in the car and I start playing the crab song from Moana. I think it's even starting to wear out a bit for Carter as his film tastes now are shifting from uh, animated Polynesian demigods to animated snowmen and small yellow minions. It wears out after a while T to the point where I don't even listen anymore. I forget it's on. We arrive and I'm like, oh yeah, we were listening to the crab song. I found that's the way a lot of things go in our lives. Things that begin is maybe favorite things, things we like, we hear over and over, things we cherish, things we deem valuable, but eventually they become worn out. Like our favorite pair of blue jeans, right? You buy a pair of blue jeans and you're like, oh, you know, it's going to take a while to break them in. But once they're broken in, you're like, doesn't your, doesn't your heart break just a little bit when there's a little hole right above the back right pocket? Because you know what's about to happen. You're going to have to get rid of them or put them in that drawer for the clothes we only wear when we're working out in the yard. When I was in the second grade, I had a favorite pair of shoes. I got all A's, uh, as I often did. Not bragging, just, just state the fact. Um, <laughs> got all A's, and my, my grandpa, my mom's dad, would always either give me $10 for all A's, but this time, the family dollar uh, flyer was on the table, and there were a pair of Beetlejuice glow-in-the-dark shoes. You may remember the cartoon Beetlejuice. And I said, Paul, can I get these instead? They might have been 8 bucks. I think you got a better deal. I wore those shoes all the time, to the point where they wore out and the bottoms flapped off. And I duct taped them together. And eventually I had to retire them. My toes were going to grow at the end of eventually. I had to wrap them up in duct tape. Some of you may remember cassette tapes. I, I had them long after all my friends had CDs. I had, you know, I would ask for Garth Brooks's latest tape or whatever. I remember in the seventh grade, my mom got me uh, a radio the tape deck on the top opened like this, so I thought it was a CD player. Fooled me. It was a cassette, day, a cassette deck. But she got me the Purple Greatest Hits album from Queen. You may know what that one is. I played it until Killer Queen drug real slow. Because <laughs> cassettes could wear out the more you do that. That only happens, though, with your favorite ones. Not, not your least favorite things. After a while, our favorite things become worn out because they're our go-to things, the items with which we're the most comfortable. Our favorite pocket knife, the, the blade gets real thin after years of sharpening it. That they're the things that are easiest to use, the things we're at most home with. And when these things get worn out, however, we don't, we don't just use them as much as we used to. Sometimes, again, they find their way into a drawer to collect dust to say, well, one day I might pick them up again. I'm afraid the same is true when it comes to those parts of the scripture that were once so fresh, familiar, and wonderful to us, revolutionary, life-changing, yet over time, they become cliche, threadbare, worn out. That we can hear them so often over and over again that after a while they become like that favorite pair of jeans, like that favorite cassette tape, worn out to where they're almost unrecognizable. And we just don't hear them the same way we used to. I think this passage of Scripture before us this morning may be the most worn out passage of Scripture of the last century, particularly the 16th verse. John 3.16 may be the most recognized, memorized, recited, and reprinted verse in the whole Bible. Uh, maybe Psalm 23 gives it a run for its money. It's been around since the author of the fourth gospel put pen to parchment. But this verse's popularity in recent decades is likely to be traced back to one man. You've probably heard me talk about him before. Rock and rolling. Anybody ever see rock and rolling used to come on TV? Nobody? Are we all that young? That's good. Roland Stewart, he was called the Rainbow Man. In the late 70s and 80s, Roland would go on these major televised sporting events and hold up big posters. And guess what was on it? John 3.16. In other news, Roland is currently serving uh, three consecutive life sentences in prison uh, after kidnapping charges in 1982, believed to be, or he kidnapped a woman, held her in a hotel room because he thought the rapture was going to take place in six days, and he plastered all over the window of that hotel room, guess what? John 3.16. 
Of course, there have been others uh, who've reminded us of this verse. First time, I'll be honest, that I ever even heard a hint of it was in the late 90s because I was a big wrestling fan. And Stone Cold Steve Austin often had emblazoned on the back of his leather vest, Austin 316. It's not the same thing, by the way, but uh, that's where I heard it. And then there was Tim Tebow, who on his eye black would often put Bible verse citations, his favorite, John 316. This verse of scripture has become so visible, so cited, that it's become a bit worn out. That you can almost just recite it without thinking about the words that you're saying. It's been pulled from out of its context in the gospel narrative. Been used as a summation of the whole story of God. And I think, I think we need to take that worn out text, that worn out verse that's so familiar to us. That's so much a part of our faith. It's marked as understood certain, settled, figured out, and we really need to hear the verse in its entire context. In the context of a conversation, so that we can have a refreshed sense of what it actually means to be born again, born anew, or as the NRSV says, born from above. Many of you in here could probably recite this entire story from memory, or at least to get the players and the places right. Nicodemus, not to be confused with the wee little man who climbed up a sycamore tree, was a Pharisee. An odd thing that he was a Pharisee, because he was a member of the Jewish high council called the Sanhedrin, mostly Sadducees. And he comes to Jesus, the writer tells us, by night in order to learn from this rabbi. And he begins the conversation in verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Nicodemus already has some understanding about what's going on with Jesus. Already understands something about who Jesus is. Clearly to Nicodemus, Jesus has at least God's blessing, God's power to do these signs that he's been doing. But Nicodemus doesn't have a chance to ask a question, to pose a problem to Jesus before Jesus responds in verse 3. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, without being born again, without being born anew. And that's where this conversation, this conversation covered by the darkness of night, begins to take on a different tone. Or does it? You see, for the last, at least the last hundred years, certain Christians have read this story about Jesus' words about being born again, born anew, born from above. It could be translated any of those ways. And understood them to be about some single event of conversion. Some instantaneous change that occurs when one prays a particular prayer. But if we really listen to Jesus' words here and look more closely at Nicodemus himself, we may come away with a refreshed understanding of what Jesus is actually saying here to the nocturnal Nicodemus and to us. You see, one of the important themes in the fourth gospel is this idea of light, light and darkness. Throughout the gospel, Jesus is calling people to come out of the darkness, the darkness of selfishness, the darkness of sin, the darkness that separates us from God. Jesus is calling people to come out of the darkness and into the light. The light of truth, the light of love, the light of a life lived in close communion with God. So it's no incidental placement of the plot for Nicodemus to come to Jesus by night. In fact, the last time in the gospel we hear about Nicodemus in chapter 19, he's still referred to as Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night. Night is the abode of darkness. It's the time when those who have something to hide, something to fear, it's when they go out. So when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, it isn't because that's when his calendar was clear. That's not because the Sanhedrin had a meeting and it got over about 730 and it was dark and so Nicodemus goes to Jesus. No, it's because Nicodemus is still in the dark. Groping for understanding, trying to find the light. So there, 
in the darkness, there in the dark of night, Jesus tells Nicodemus that one can't truly see or hope to understand the kingdom of God unless they're born again from above, from a different womb, a different source of life. And so naturally, we've heard it so much, we don't understand how crazy that sounds, right? Naturally, Nicodemus is confused. So he asks Jesus, how how can you be born twice? And think about it for Nicodemus in the first century. If you're old, despite all the pills we might have to take, despite all the doctor's visits we might have to make, to grow old is to be wise, to have things figured out, to have them settled. Who wants to go back to when you didn't know anything? Who wants to go back when you're young? Who wants to be reborn as a baby who has someone to have to take care of them? So naturally, Nicodemus is confused. How can a person be born a second time, especially a full-grown man? And you you can see the imagery. Nicodemus says, how does one go back into his mother's womb? Why would anybody want to be born again? And so much is already settled. So much is already figured out and understood. But Jesus Jesus answers as only Jesus does, indirectly. In verses 5 through 8. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. All right, so do you get it now? Can we have the invitation? No. Well, neither did Nicodemus. In fact, the last thing we hear from Nicodemus in this conversation in the darkness is in verse 9. How can these things be? I mean, that's the most basic question when you're confused. How, How does this make sense? How can these things be? He's still in the darkness. Things have not been quite bright out, brought out to the light for him yet. And Jesus sort of rebukes him in verse 10, but then in verses 11 through 15, Jesus explains himself. But in doing so, transitions his conversation from Nicodemus, almost as if his words are coming out of the page to us. Because it shifts from the second person plural, or second person singular, you, Nicodemus, to the second person plural, y'all. I do think they should have picked that up in translation. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. But you, Nicodemus, do not receive our testimony. If I had told y'all about earthly things and y'all do not believe, how can y'all believe if I tell you of heavenly things? You see how that shifts and it makes a little difference? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who is descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. From here on out, Nicodemus is silent. And that's the end of Jesus' words to him. What follows in verses 16 and 17 are really likely words from the gospel writer. Maybe you have a red-letter Bible. Maybe the person sitting next to you does. One of you might have 16 and 17 in red ink. One of you might have it in black ink. We don't know. Did Jesus say it or did the author say it? I tend to think the author of the gospel did. There's no punctuation in Greek to indicate who is speaking here. So some red letter Bibles print it in red, some print it in black. Jesus is calling either way to Nicodemus to come out of the darkness and embrace the light of life and the fullness of who Jesus is. When Jesus speaks of birth from above to Nicodemus, when he's talking about is not some singular instant of conversion. Birth isn't an end to itself. None of us are born whole human beings, talking, walking, with degrees in hand. No. Jesus is, is, is talking about that this is a beginning. So Nicodemus was quick to confess that God was with Jesus and the signs he was able to perform, but that was as far as Nicodemus was willing to go. To claim much more would be to risk everything. His respectability, his place of power on the Sanhedrin, even his life, because they would have identified him as a co-conspirator with Jesus. 
Jesus was calling Nicodemus out of that safety in the darkness where he could hide and no one could see him. Calling him out to say, look, this is about selflessness. This is about the giving of your whole life to God. Not just about recognizing that a few signs and miracles happened. It's about coming out of the darkness. To no longer hide your longing to do and be more for God. Jesus was calling Nicodemus to be born again from the top, from above, to begin a new life out of the darkness and into the light, to let go of all that he believed to be settled, all that he believed he had figured out, to trust Jesus. And Jesus is calling us to do the same. Jesus is calling us out of the darkness where we can calmly, quietly, safely practice as much of our faith as we're comfortable with. Calling us out of this place where we keep our faith hidden behind platitudes and well-worn Bible verses. Too many of us stay on that darkened edge of our faith, hoping to skate by with a simple confession or a certificate that proves we were once dunked or sprinkled. But Jesus is calling us to so much more, calling us out of that. Too many of us are afraid to step into the full light of the good news of God's kingdom. Too afraid to begin a new life because so far in this one, I've got it all figured out. I've got it all planned. I've got it all the way it's supposed to be. I can mark down to the point what I'm going to do tomorrow. But Jesus is calling me out of that darkness of certainty into the light of his uncertainty. To be born from above. Because to step out into the light means others will see us. Others will judge us as crazy, as bleeding hearts, as gullible, as soft. We might be afraid that they'll tell us to hush whenever we hold up the love of Christ as our example for living. But Jesus calls Nicodemus to be reborn from above into the light so that we may see more of what God has for him, more of who God is. And Jesus is calling us too to be reborn into that light out of the darkness, to experience more of what God has for us, more of who God is, and more of what God's kingdom looks like here and now. It's that final verses of our passage this morning, words that are so familiar to us, I think, that have a deeper meaning out of the darkness and in the light. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. But it doesn't end there. Verse 17, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Where in the past, these verses may have been used as a sort of litmus test to divide those who are bound for glory and those who are damned to hell. We read them today knowing that the life God promises to those who believe is a life that begins here and now in the full light of God. So may we who believe in God and his sent son, Jesus, step out of the dark, out of the shrouded shadows that keep us living our faith out loud, that keep us from living our faith in the daylight. May we answer that call to come out of that darkness and into the daylight for all the world to see. May those of you who have not believed, who have simply sat on the dark edges of belief waiting for God to show up to prove God's self to you through signs and miracles. Hear the words of Jesus and be reborn this day so that you may begin a new life in the light of God's love, a new life lived in God's kingdom. And may we all hear Christ's words to Nicodemus as an invitation to step out of the darkness and into the bold, loving light of faith. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you've called us, just as you've called Nicodemus, out of the darkness and into the light, to be reborn, to be born anew, to be born from above, and to understand that to be reborn is to begin not to reach fullness. So help us, God, to trust not ourselves in the darkness, but you in your full light of love. 
as you call us, as you call us even now to be born again, anew from above. We pray these things in Christ's name.